Hello everyone and welcome to our module on embryonic genes. As you know the human embryo forms from a single cell, a fertilized egg, and that single cell goes on to produce a multicellular organism with organs like hearts and lungs and limbs and a head and eyes and ears. And this process involves the turning on and turning off of lots of different genes. The entire process is complex and poorly understood, but there are a couple of embryonic genes whose roles have been well characterized in the basic science literature. These are listed on the screen here, and we're going to go through what each of these genes does in the rest of this video. The first thing I want to do is define an important term, and that's the term patterning. The fertilized egg, which is a single cell, becomes a multicellular organism with a head, arms, and legs, also with organs like the heart in a certain position and the kidneys in a certain position, and that process is called embryonic patterning, and many of the genes we'll talk about in this video are important for normal patterning of the embryo. The first gene we'll talk about is the Sonic Hedgehog gene, or SHH gene, and if you don't know this, Sonic the Hedgehog was a video game character shown here on the screen. That's where this gene gets its name. This gene makes the Sonic Hedgehog protein, which is an embryonic signaling protein, and it sends a signal to tissues to develop into many important structures, including limbs and the brain and the eyes. And the two key roles of this gene that you should know about for step one are central nervous system development and limb development. In the central nervous system, the sonic hedgehog gene is important for proper formation of the forebrain. The signals from this gene product separate the right and left brain and establish the midline. So if the sonic hedgehog gene is dysfunctional, this can lead to the rare condition called holoprosencephaly. The word holo means whole and prosencephalon is the forebrain, so this will be a baby born with a whole forebrain, meaning the baby does not have left and right halves of the brain. This is a slide from our neurology video on embryology, and in that video I talk about how the prosencephalon, or forebrain, separates into two halves, as shown in this picture on the screen here, at about five weeks. In holoprosencephaly, there's a failure of cleavage of the forebrain, or prosencephalon, so the left and right hemispheres do not separate. This can lead to a baby that's born with a single lobed brain. On imaging, there will be no left and right hemispheres. In addition, because the brain does not divide in half, often the face is abnormal, so you can see facial abnormalities like cleft lip and palate, and even cyclopia, which means the presence of a single eye. And in this picture, I've shown a mild case of holoprosencephaly on the left, where the child just has a cleft lip. On the right side, I've shown a severe case where the child has a single eye. That's called cyclopia. So that's the central nervous system role for the sonic hedgehog gene. Now let's talk about its other important role in embryology, and that has to do with limb development. You will see this described in your textbooks as limb patterning, and by this they mean the development of the body pattern with the arms and the legs in their proper position. And in order for limbs to develop normally, they have to develop along three planes. And let's talk about that in the next few slides. In embryologic terms, limb development is described as occurring along three planes. The first plane is the easiest to understand. This is proximal to distal. So for example, if the arm is going to develop normally, the humerus must develop followed by the radius, followed by the wrist. This is proximal to distal development. The second axis is more confusing. This is the dorsal to ventral axis. The easiest way to remember this axis is to remember this famous picture by Leonardo da Vinci that I've shown on the screen here. Notice that this man has his arm pointing out to the side with the thumb and the palm out in front. In other words, the thumb and the palm are sticking out of the page towards you looking at it. The thumb and the palm are the ventral side, so that includes the flexor muscles, and the back of the hand is the dorsal side, so that includes the extensor muscles. And then the final axis is the anterior-posterior axis, and by this axis, in embryologic terms, anterior means towards the head. So the thumb and the radius in this man shown on the screen are pointing upwards, so that is the anterior side. The ulna and the fingers are pointing downwards, and that is the posterior axis. Just to make this more clear, I've zoomed in on the arm from the picture on the last slide. So the proximal to distal axis is in this direction. The thumb is pointing upwards, that is anterior. The little finger is pointing downwards, that is posterior. And then the dorsal to ventral axis is going in and out of the screen. So the dorsal axis is going backwards. Those are the extensor muscles of the arm and hand. And the ventral axis is coming out of the screen. Those are the flexor muscles of the wrist and arm. So the reason I went through all those planes is because different genes are important for normal development of the limbs along the different planes. 
The first plane we'll discuss is the proximal to distal plane, and critical to development along this plane is a structure called the apical ectodermal ridge. And the name of the structure tells you everything you need to know about it. It's made up of ectoderm, which is overlying mesoderm, and it's apical, meaning it is at the tip of the developing limb. And this is an area of limb bud formation, and if you remove this region of the growing limb, which has been done experimentally, the limb will stop growing. So I've drawn a picture down here at the bottom of the screen to help you understand this. You've got this blue ridge of ectodermal tissue overlying mesoderm, and it is absolutely necessary for limb growth in the proximal to distal direction. The reason the ridge is so critical for limb growth is because signals are going back and forth between the mesoderm and the apical ectodermal ridge that cause the limb to grow. The ridge influences the underlying mesoderm to grow. A zone called the progress zone forms in the mesoderm with growing cells. In addition, the mesoderm also sends signals to the ectodermal ridge to keep the ridge active. And this brings us to one of our second key embryonic genes that you should know for the step one exam, and that is the FGF gene, which codes for fibroblast growth factor. This is absolutely essential for normal limb growth in the proximal to distal direction. If you remove the ridge, as we talked about before, the limb will not grow. However, if you replace FGF, you will get normal growth. So it turns out, and we know this from many experiments, that fibroblast growth factor is the key element in the apical ectodermal ridge to cause limb growth in the proximal to distal direction. Now let's talk about development of the limb along the dorsal to ventral axis. Remember, this is the axis that includes the flexors and extensors. An easy way to remember this axis is to remember that the palm of your hand is a ventral structure and the back of your hand is a dorsal structure. Development along this plane depends on multiple genes. Most of them have strange names like radical fringe and engrailed one. Some are important for development along the dorsal side, some along the ventral side, and some at the border between the two sides. But of all these genes, the one that's most important to know is the WNT7A gene. WNT7A is the key gene for development of the dorsal side of the limb. This gene is active in the apical ectodermal ridge and it influences the underlying mesoderm to develop into the dorsal surface. The way this gene functions is its product activates a gene called LMX1 in the mesoderm and this dorsalizes the mesoderm. And the reason we know this is because experiments have been done in which the LMX1 gene was knocked out and this leads to limbs that are produced with two ventral sides. In mouse embryos, the mice are born with soles on both surfaces of their paws. So because of these experiments, we know that LMX1 is important for dorsalizing one side of the growing limb and WNT7A can activate the LMX1 gene. On the ventral side of the developing limb, the gene in GRAILD1 represses the activity of WNT7A, and that's what makes the ventral side come out differently than the dorsal side. So the bottom line here is that the WNT7A gene is what makes the dorsal side of the limb dorsal. Absence of WNT7A activity is what makes the ventral side ventral. Let me briefly mention the WNT genes. This is a family of genes that were originally described in the Drosophila fly. Their name stands for winged integration gene, and these genes are found in many species, including humans. In early embryology in humans, they're important for regulation of the dorsal to ventral axis, as we just described. They also have some roles that have been described later in embryology for development along the anterior-posterior axis. And if you want to read more about this family of genes, I've put a nice review article at the bottom of the screen here. The final plane of limb development we need to discuss is the anterior-posterior plane. And remember that the thumb points up, which is anteriorly, and the little finger points downward, which is posteriorly. And normal development of the limb in this plane depends heavily on a structure called the zone of polarizing activity. If you look at my diagram on the screen here, the zone of polarizing activity is a zone of tissue found in the posterior limb, which means at the bottom near the little finger. And this zone of polarizing activity influences the apical ectodermal ridge, and that leads to normal development along the anterior-posterior plane. And the major signaling molecule produced by the zone of polarizing activity is our friend, the sonic hedgehog protein. So the sonic hedgehog gene is essential not only for CNS development, as we described before, but also for limb development in the anterior to posterior plane. The last group of embryonic genes I'll discuss are the homeobox genes or Hox genes. These genes all code for transcription factors and many of them are regulators of anterior-posterior axis development. 
Homeotic genes get their name because homeosis is the process of transforming one structure into another. So homeotic genes lead to formation of body segments because they transform tissue in the embryo into a structure. And if you have a mutation of a homeotic gene, this leads to abnormal body part formation. And it turns out that all of the many homeotic genes that have been described have similar sequences of about 180 bases. This sequence is called the homeobox. It's part of the gene, and therefore these are called homeobox homeobox or Hox genes. The homeobox genes are a family of genes and they have names like Hox A1, Hox B1, Hox D1. You can read about them in detail in your textbooks if you wish, but what you should know for the step one exam is that rare mutations of some Hox genes have been described and they all result in abnormal limb formation, which should make sense because I told you that these genes are necessary for proper formation along the anterior posterior axis. In fruit flies, when mutations of the Hox genes occur, the legs will grow from the head instead of the antenna. That shows you how important and their role is. In humans, rare mutations have been described as leading to polydactility, which is the presence of extra fingers or toes. This is a person on the screen here with polydactility who has an extra finger. Also, mutations of these genes have been described as leading to syndactility. This is where there is fusion of fingers or toes, as shown in this example on the right side of the screen. I'll finish with this summary slide of the key genes that you should know for the step one exam. The sonic hedgehog gene is important for normal development of the hemispheres of the brain. Abnormal function of the sonic hedgehog gene can lead to holoprosencephaly. This gene also has a key role in normal development of the limb along the anterior to posterior axis. This gene is active in the zone of polarizing activity, which influences the apical ectodermal ridge. Fibroblast growth factor is important for normal development of the limb along the proximal to distal axis. This gene is active in the apical ectodermal ridge. The WNT7A gene is important for normal development along the dorsal to ventral axis. This gene is what dorsalizes the limb and makes the dorsal side dorsal. And then finally, the Hox genes are important for normal development along the anterior-posterior axis of the limb, and mutations of these genes have been associated with abnormal formation of the digits and toes. And that concludes our video on embryonic genes.